Okay. All right. Um, thanks, Sutika, uh, for the invitation. Um, to have set up a great program. I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, all right. So, so all of you must have heard about machine learning. Right? It's not a new term. And um, uh, whether you think it's a hype or you think it's really cool, you have some notion about what it is. And I'll just begin with what I think it is. Okay. So to me, uh, it's essentially a set of algorithms that um, learn from data in order to do you know, some task that is useful. Okay, so it could be some really simple task like this one. You want to predict, uh, given a picture of a fruit, whether it's a mango or, a, or an orange. Yeah? Um, so essentially what you want is to have a set of rules or a formula that you can um, apply to your input. So the input here is, in this case, it's an image, right? But it could be other kinds of inputs. Um, and so that, you know, the, 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 the machine or the computer can come up with the answer of whether it's an angle or not, right? Um, except that you don't want to sit and feed the formula yourself. You want the computer to figure it out. And that really is machine learning, right? Because you want, you want the algorithm or the computer to figure out what the rules should be. Right? I mean, if I were going to input the rules, I would say things like, um, maybe I have some image processing done first. And then I say that if, if it looks like a spherical object, it's more likely to be an orange. Um, if the color is more yellow, it's likely to be a mango and so on. But you don't want to sit and do this. Um, you want the machine to figure it out. Right? And that's essentially um, what machine learning is. So if you want the machine to figure it out, uh, so the algorithm should have access to lots of mango and orange pictures, right? Um, because the reason I could feed in those uh, that that in information or you know about the sort of spherical nature of uh, um, oranges and so on is because I have seen all these uh, these fruits from when I was a, a toddler, right? Um, and so the machine should also be able to see or get access to a lot of data to be able to make these um, um, uh, rules or formula that you can then apply uh, to do this simple task. Okay, um, so, so it looks a little complex, right, that you have to give these pictures and then for it to learn. And then you, I have not yet said anything about what goes in the algorithm, but we talk about that. Um, on the other hand, um, our brains are constantly doing this, right? And we've been doing it right from when we were babies, right? We we're figuring out uh, what's what, what's a caregiver's giver and who's a caregiver and who's a stranger and so on, right? Um, and the reason is again because we have, you know, uh, been seeing a lot of these uh, data points. The reason, um, in fact, we we are really good at such uh, tasks, uh, figuring out whether it's a mango or not, right? But, for example, you must have seen these uh, really annoying uh, captures, right? Which come up when you are, uh, let's say, trying to access some social media account or any account, really. You know, it wants to make sure, um, uh, the, the server wants to make sure that you are a real person and not some, it's not some attack from some computer. Um, and that's why we are able to sort of say that the third letter um, is W. Right? And, and, and and a computer might find it a little hard. However, uh, however now things are getting, um, you know, the computers are getting better at this. Um, and because the computers are getting better at this, uh, we moved on now to even more annoying captures. This one I absolutely hate, uh, where you have to identify um, um, boxes which match some criteria. Again, the pretext is that they want to know whether you are uh, human or not, um, and it might look fairly innocent, uh, but there, oftentimes, they're also using the human expertise to annotate their own database. Okay, so let me let me just explain. Um, so here you have to identify all squares um, that contain um, what that matches that that fellow there, which is a cat, right? And maybe the database itself, the backend, does not know that the top left corner, can you see the mouse now? I'm guessing not. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. We can. Okay. Yeah, we can. So this fellow is, uh, 
you know, it was hard for their own method or their own uh, program to know or to identify as a cat. Um, so when you identify all the other eight squares correctly, whatever you say for this guy, the backend is going to update their own database. When you say, if, let's say you get all these other eight correct, then the, uh, uh, the database thinks that, you know, the, the pro capture program thinks that you're doing it all right. You're a human. So you're, this guy also must be a cat if you labeled it a cat. Of course, they don't tell you beforehand which is the unlabeled um, picture because then the strategy won't work. Uh, but essentially, you know, this is something that, um, in a sense, we are all crowdsourcing and helping them uh, do. Sometimes you'll see these two words, text uh, messages come up and you have to guess both of them. And so again, there you are actually helping them annotate uh, documents. So we are, bottom line is we're really good at such uh, things. Um, but, but what if you get an image that looks like this, right? which is an mixed tape? Right? And the question is, uh, does this person have uh, TV? Right? Um, so I can't answer this question. Um, and I'm just going to take a wild guess and say that most people in this audience also cannot, uh, because we're not trained radiologists, right? A trained radiologist might be, will be able to uh, give the answer to this question, looking at the chest X-ray, but we won't. Right? Again, because the person has been trained and has knows what um, a TB infection looks like. And so pulmonary just means uh, lung. Okay. Um, what about a question like this? Is this DNA bacterial or human? Um, and you might get such questions in, in forensics, maybe, um, um, or, 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 or in whether to see, or, or maybe you want to know whether um, a certain um, extracted DNA contains an infection or not, or something like that. Uh, but that's kind of hard to answer, right, for any human, just looking at the string of um, ACGTs. Uh, which is why we kind of need to have um, such ML solutions, okay? So how does one go about building these solutions, with, especially for questions that we humans cannot really uh, answer? So the very first step is that you really need to understand the problem, right? And so I understand that the audience here is mostly um, composed of first year, people who've just done their first year um, undergrad, undergrad, and when I was your at your age, uh, I I would have been floored at that question because I didn't even know what DNA was, what this bunch of ACGT meant. Because the last I think biology course I took was in tenth. Uh, after that, I took some in, in graduate school. But anyway, when I was at your level, I really would not have been able to even uh, you know understand. I would not have understood the problem at all. So let's just you know, go through what I mean by uh, DNA or what that data looked like or was coming from that. All right, so um, I think because of COVID and, and, and things like that, people uh, are much more aware of what DNA RNA is. Uh, but in, in this context, right, um, we're looking at DNA um, and uh, the, the DNA is a, so, uh, is, a, is a long molecule where our cells store a lot of information and a lot of hereditary information as well. Um, and I said it's a long molecule because it's essentially a polymer, like a polymer. And it has this repeating units okay, of nucleotides. There are four types of nucleotides. And uh, you see the alphabet. That's where you get the alphabet from, right? A, C, G, T stands for these four nucleotides. And uh, like I said, it's a polymer. Okay? What you see here is a single strand of DNA. Right? So the string, you, you, just, you can just easily read out the sequence of the DNA. And that's what I was showing you earlier. Um, and um, if you remember, uh, you know, when you say DNA, you remember that it actually um, it, it, it occurs in a double helix, right? It doesn't really look like this. So essentially, you have two strands in your DNA. Right? And this is the picture that you see in textbooks or you know, even outside. Right? You have this twisted double helix. Um, but you'll notice that if you know the sequence in one strand, the sequence in the other strand is just pretty much automatic because of this very special pairing. I'm not going to go into this pairing because that's not important. All that is important is that you can get a strand of DNA and that's, uh, that captures all the information that is stored in the double helix. Okay? 
So that's when you understood the problem. <laughs> okay, so just like we have DNA, bacteria has its own DNA, right? Um, okay, so now we have, we are, we are slightly closer to understanding and trying to uh, solve this problem. Um, what if you had a lot of access to data? You still can't solve the problem just looking at this picture, but you know, what if you had a lot of, uh, had access to already sequenced bacterial DNA and human DNA? Can you do something now? Can you look at the um, proportions or something about those letters and, and try to come up with a rule uh, that you can use later on um, when a new um, unlabeled DNA strand is given to you? So uh, what helps a lot, um, and one, one way of thinking about it is using probability okay, or probabilistic models. Okay? Um, and we all, I'm sure you all know what probability is, right? I mean, it's, it's a number between zero and one uh, or zero and 100%, right? depending on how you're normalizing, which reflects uh, your belief in some event happening, right? So you have a probability of an event. So for example, let's say you toss a coin, what is the probability that you'll get a head? You will get a head, 50%, uh, right? I mean, that's, I think, a reasonable estimate, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so what now, uh, let me pose a slightly different question. If you toss a coin five times, what is the probability that you get a HD, HH? So now uh, let's go a little bit, uh, let's talk about some lingo, right? So what I just told you was uh, a sequence, okay, of um, coin outcomes, toss outcomes, and this I'm gonna call our data, right, D. So when I say, what is the probability that you get this? This is how I'll write it. What is the probability of seeing this data? Well, the first time you toss the coin and you, the probability of getting ahead, we've established is half. Now you take the same coin and um, you assume that just because you got ahead previously doesn't influence your next outcome, right? Next toss. Um, so these are all independent events. Um, I'm sure you, you must have done a little bit about independence, but if you're, if you're not, just take my word for it. So these are independent events, so you can multiply them. Okay, so the probability of getting, a, of getting a HT is one by four, but you've not stopped there. Uh, the data continues, right? And this is the complete probability um, of seeing the sequence of tosses, right? um, uh, when uh, um, considering that you have a coin like that. Right? Now, what instead of that coin, uh, what if you had a Shole coin? Now, you, you're probably really young <laughs> to know what Shole uh, was, but it was a movie. And if you've not seen it, you have a lot of, you know, in this lockdown, if you get access, see it. It's a complete just entertainment. It's nothing really, uh, I mean, yeah. All right. So, uh, so anyway, the, point, <laughs> the point of this uh, picture is that there is a coin in this movie, right? Uh, which uh, one of the characters um, uses to, you know, bet, with, uh, with the other character, and uh, it always comes up as head. Okay, so it's a biased coin, right? So it's always a two-sided head, something like that, right? So what if you had such a coin, right? Uh, things would change. What if you had a slightly biased coin, right? Then you would have, again, a slightly different probability, not half, but maybe, you know, uh, uh, heading towards uh, a head or a tail, depending on which, how I've written the zero one. So you can model this um, uh, this thing with uh, a distribution that we call a Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so there are two outcomes, right? Just a head or a tail. So if you know the probability of one outcome, the other one is just one minus p. So it's a discrete distribution. And this, what you see on the left here, is a. Um, should I look at the chat um, or not? We we'll let you know if there's a question oh, okay. <laughs> or towards the yeah, end. I should not look at the chat. But, <laughs> but if you have questions uh, that are really pressing, um, I don't mind if you just stop me and ask, because otherwise, you know, the next slides won't make sense. So I, I'm, I'm completely all right if you interrupt me. Okay. Um, so this is a um, even point, right? A, a, a 50 50 chance point. This is how you would represent it. Um, this would be 
the Shole coin, okay? uh, where everything is shifted to one side. This would be a less obvious Shole coin, right? Where uh, it's, it's a little more, a little biased towards the head, but not completely, right? So there's still some chance of getting a tail. So the purpose of showing this is that now, uh, depending on which coin you're using, your probability of your data is going to change. Right? So if you had uh, the, a pair coin, we calculated that as this 0.03. Right? Now, if it is a um, biased coin, so first of all, if it is a completely, if it is a Shole coin, this is going to be zero. You see that, right? Because you're never going to get a tail. So this probability would be zero. But what if, if it is a biased coin, going biased towards head, um, you're going to get, you know, this is how you write it. So uh, this is called probability of seeing the data conditional. If you don't know what that line is, you just take it as something that is given that what you know, okay, now that conditional on what we already know. So the first part was that you already know that the um, coin was fair. And the second is when uh, the, the coin is uh, a little biased. So the probability of the head goes up and uh, accordingly you multiply. So you you can write this in a concise format as the, uh, the number, the, prob the bias P raised to the number of heads you saw, right? In this case, four right? and the number of tails. And so you get a higher probability. So now, if you were asked to guess whether the coin used was fair or this special bias coin, just looking at these two values, you might say that, you know, it's very likely that, it's more likely that um, the coin was a biased one. Okay, so this is the concept that we're going to use to solve the problem about our uh, bacterial DNA. Except that our bacterial DNA, it doesn't come from a coin, right? Um, it has, it just doesn't have an alphabet of size two, it has an alphabet of size four, okay? So this Bernoulli distribution is not going to work. So you start looking up at what distributions might work. Right? You do a little bit of uh, research there, and you see that there is an extension of the Bernoulli distribution, which is called the categorical distribution. Okay? So instead of two possibilities, you have K. In this case, K is four. Right? And maybe the bacterial DNA is more AT rich than the human DNA. Right? And if that is the case, then given that you have this new sequence, you can predict whether it comes from the bacteria or not by just doing the same calculation that we did for the points, right? So you just multiply the individual probabilities. This again, okay, so this is, you're making lots of assumptions here, right? Because, I mean, it's not like um, uh, some intelligent person or design person is, is, is tossing a coin, you know, tossing this uh, four-sided die to decide uh, what the bacterial DNA is going to be. So it, 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 in principle, you should not be multiplying these, uh, but you know, you can, if, if, if it's going to work, if it's going to help you, you can, you know, uh, uh, making sure that you understand the assumptions that go into, that you have put into the model that you have built. Okay, but now again, this is not really machine learning, right? Because I already told you, I mean, this is something like the hard-coded rules because you already know bacterial DNA is AT, AT, AT rich and human is not. So really you want to figure out what those distributions are from your data. You remember that we have a lot of data from our, uh, I told you that, that maybe you have a lot of bacterial data, human data. How then would you, uh, can you come up with those rules? So let's go back to the point because that's a little easier to sort of handle. Okay, um, so now uh, we don't know that it's a Shole coin or a bias coin, nothing, right? But we do have the data from the tosses of many, many, um, uh, so data from many, many coin tosses. If somebody's sitting there and tossing it for you um, and you're counting the number of heads and tails that you get. So let's say the total number of heads you got was K, total number of tails, that's sort of N is the total number of the size of your data. P is the bias now, which is unknown, right? You want to infer it. So we've already established this, right? You remember we saw that probability of um, seeing that sequence, saw that it was P raised to number of heads and so on. Um, so one way of estimating, figuring out what P could, you know, what, what the P could be is to maximize this, this probability, this uh, complete 
uh, expression. It's actually a probability, right? And if you try plotting it, right, across the P, remember the P is unknown. You know the K, you know the N, right? And let's say your N was 100 and your K was 70. So it's like saying that I tossed the coin 100 times, 70 of them were heads. Can you tell me now what the bias of the coin might be? I think most of us would say that it's 0.7, right? Because you saw 70 heads. So if you plot this distribution, right? P raised to K, uh, P raised to 70 and to one minus P raised to minus 70, this is what it'll look like. And the maximum does it, in fact come up there. Um, so you don't really always have to plot. Sometimes you can plot, but sometimes you cannot. But then if you cannot, you can always, you know, um, uh, use some calculus and, you know, find the derivative and so on and find the, the place where it's maximum, right? Um, sometimes you can't always do that. You cannot always solve it, solve it analytically. Then you have to take help of applied mathematics and some optimization techniques to come up with the best P. Okay, what we just did is called the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, so you don't just a term. In case later on somebody says maximum likelihood, you should know it's not really that complicated. It's just this. Okay, um, and so what we're doing now is getting closer to machine learning because we have this data and we figured out what the bias would be, and that's what we can do for the bacterial case. We can learn the rules, figure out what are the better, best um, um, probabilities that we can use for the future, you know, future new sequence. Um, so that might be a little um, sort of, you know, something not that you see uh, every day. But these kind of rules are also learned um, in, in your spam um, finder. Or this should be this program called Spam Assassin long ago. I don't know what, what is currently used. But um, many of these um, uh, programs or algorithms that detect spam actually use these kind of probabilities, right? So if you read this, you know, very, you know, you just have to look at a few words and you know that this is spam, right? So for example, you know, you have this. For me, if it's an email that I have got, the dear sir itself is kind of telling me that this is probably not something that I need to uh, look at carefully, okay? Um, this, and then there are these words, congratulations, and some crazy URL and things like that, right? Um, and these are uh, the red flags that even you see. You might get some words common in a legitimate email, right? Like congratulations, that same iPhone, whatever that model is. Uh, but you know that the frequency of these words um, are is much more in a spam email, right? And this is exactly what um, the spam finders do, right? So you you also sometimes help it, help the uh, spam finders tell them that this is spam, this is not spam. So you're helping label these emails as spam and not spam. Can you can you see uh, the screen? Nothing has changed, right? No, all all's good. Everything is the same. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So how does uh, how do these how do these programs uh, uh, work? All right, so now you don't have just one coin or one possibility, right? You have lots of words. And so what you do is create a table. And this is actually something that if you like programming, you can do yourself. You don't have, you, you can look at your spam inbox uh, that, have, that, you know, if you have a Google account or, or whatever account, I think that most of these uh, email servers do a good job in labeling spam. So you can look at those and do this in, in, on your own time. Um, and you look at all the words that uh, are, are, are present in those uh, emails and then make a table for every word and every email and just, just you know, tabulate was the word present or not? Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. And then what you can do is compute the probability of that word being present given that it's a spam email, right? Because that's, you have all this table com, uh, com, is, com, uh, contains all the emails that are spam. And you do this for every word, like a big chunk of words. You can ignore the commonly used words like though, you know, okay? and you can get this table. You do a similar exercise. Um, sorry. So this is instead of once, I can't see the next slide. So excuse the transition issues. Okay. So, so what we're saying here is that you have D different points now, right? yes and no coins um, like head and tails but you have you do, 
each coin now means different things and each coin now has a different bias, which is what you can estimate in the same way that we did in, from the head tail problem. And that essentially is machine learning. Of course, you do the same exercise with the legitimate emails. Okay? So for the same words, you calculate those probabilities and using that, you can build um, a, a slightly, you know, slightly more complex model or a, a, a class a classifier, so to speak, which will classify a given new sequence, which you will compute, uh, or sort of tabulate in the same format, right? So you have these uh, two tables: one for the spam, one for the non-spam legitimate emails, and given a new email, right? You will parse it for the same words see if the, each of those words is present or not. And then given these, you will sort of try to figure out which bag it fits in, okay? And if you're interested in doing this right from me, I can tell you how, um, how you can combine these probabilities together, okay? All right. Um, so this is all what uh, you, know, you, you will see uh, in a regular uh, setting, right? So I'll just tell you a little bit uh, about some work that I do okay, in biology. Okay, so you remember that uh, these are the four general steps that I take, right, or I think of as important when you're developing a much machine learning based algorithm. Um, and we, we spoke mostly about, um, you know, learning the, the formula or the root, right? And that's of course crucial, but many times you also get some novel insights from the machine learning algorithm and, and the data, uh, which you, you know, as a, as, as a lay person or even a domain expert might not know about, okay? All right, so let's uh, go back to our DNA um, introduction. I'll just remind you again. Okay, so you remember that we have uh, uh, DNA. The complete DNA is called the genome. Okay, so if you've heard of the human genome, that is actually a lot of DNA. Okay, we can we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? We get one set from our father, one set from our mother, right? And um, so together, actually, we have six billion letters, okay? three billion from one set, one one parent in one cell. Okay, so that's a lot of Right? So, so people have been um, trying for uh, for decades now, and now they have a working model of uh, working um, genome sequence. If if you cannot hear me at any point, please stop me. I see these uh, messages saying that things are unstable. But if it's really bad, then I'll switch my provider. Okay. Um, so what you can do is go to this website and put in um, some coordinates, it might give you a default coordinate, and you can actually see at any particular pro chromosome, like this is chromosome five, this is this location on the chromosome five, what nucleotide the human genome contains. Now this is some human genome, right? You're, you might be, each one of us is gonna be slightly different. Okay, you can zoom out, right? You can see the uh, sequences. Um, there's a lot of, really a lot of information and a lot of data that our cells maintain all our cells contain the same DNA, okay? Um, and what is the purpose of this DNA, okay? So parts of this DNA contain what is called genes, okay? And um, I'm sure you, you've heard the term gene a lot, but it's essentially just a section of the DNA. The DNA itself is always gonna look like AC, a bunch of ACGTs. Um, of course, there's gonna be proteins when you look at the chromatins part, but the DNA itself is just a bunch of ACGTs. Parts of it are going to be different genes, and the genes contain information to create a specific protein. Okay, so if you remember from your school biology, uh, the proteins are what do all the work in your uh, cells or in your body, right? So, so the first step um, in transferring this information from the DNA to the protein is called transcription. Okay, so think of this DNA molecule as a long, as a, as a really big recipe book. Okay, the recipe book contains recipes of lots of different um, dishes. Right now, the recipe book is sitting inside a library. Okay, and you decide that you know today you want to have, um, uh, let's say, you want to have some um, 
Punjabi food, right? And you want to cook it yourself. Um, so you go to the library and you look up, you see that book and you start deciding which, uh, you know, which items you want to make. You can't take the whole book outside the library, but the librarian allows you to take photocopies. So the RNA molecule is the photocopying machine. Okay, uh, is the photocopy. The transcription is the machinery that is going to make photocopies for you. Now this photocopy, you can take, or you can take a photo on your phone, whatever it is. Um, you, this, this is the copy of the chicken, which you take to your kitchen, and then you cook, right? And you make that item, and that's your protein. Right? So this is the gene, that's your recipe that you're following and making into a protein. But the recipe book never goes out, stays there in the details. Okay, So we have lots of genes, about 30,000 genes, um, depending on how you're counting. So we have the ability of creating 30,000 proteins. Okay? And all our cells contain the exact, pretty much the exact same DNA. Okay? So the same recipe book is present in all the cells. How then do our cells look so different? Because if you remember, the proteins are the ones that are um, giving, doing all the work. So essentially, the protein profile is what giving the characteristics to your cells. Um, so the muscle cells look very different from the nerve cells you can see there. They also do very different things, right? So the proteins are going to be really different in each cell type. So it's like saying, um, if, you're, if you want to make Punjabi food, you're not going to take, um, uh, you're not going to look at the recipe of, um, uh, let's say, uh, Hakka noodles, right? Because you're not interested. It doesn't go well with your menu, right? So what happens is that your cell is, con is controlling based on what is required, which genes are going to be expressed. This is called expression of genes. In other words, which proteins or RNA molecules, which photocopies are going to be made. So in a, one cell type, you might have, you know, gene A uh, being really, you know, needed. So those proteins are going to be created. Protein molecules or many copies might be created. Um, gene B might be at a moderate quantity. Gene C is absolutely not required, maybe, because it just does not go well with protein A. It does, adds nothing to the cell type. Um, and another cell type, you might have a different distribution. Okay, so... So a key question that biologists are trying to understand is how do cells control this, right? Because the recipe book is the same. How is the cell deciding which recipe book, or uh, which recipe to make photocopies of? Okay? So it turns out a lot of this regulation or control is happening at the transcriptional level, right? At the place where the photocopies are being made because there's no point in spending effort and, uh, and money making photocopies of recipes that you're never gonna use, right? So, so a lot of control is happening at the very uh, top level. A little bit happens here also. This is like saying that uh, maybe I get guests and I, and I might need to make something on the fly. So let me have uh, the recipe um, photocopies available. Okay, and also these recipe copies, uh, photocopies, if you're as good as keeping things uh, uh, neatly as me, then those recipe uh, copies disappear and, and get damaged and are destroyed after after that that event of, of creation, uh, creating the recipe, right? So, uh, the, the meal. So so essentially, these molecules are also um, you know get destroyed. So you can't just keep these RNA molecules lying around. All right. So how does this regulation happen? Okay. So I'm just going to very quickly um, go through that, and then we'll see how we can use machine learning uh, to gain insights on this in this part okay, so let's say you have some gene okay, which um, is required okay? um, now although although there are 30,000 genes um, in our on our gene on our DNA uh, if you just put all the genes next to each other all the recipes next to each other um, it only comprises of about five percent of those three billion um, molecules uh, three billion uh, letters so there's a lot of non-recipe stuff okay, in, in our book. Okay, so this non-recipe stuff, we're still, still trying to understand what these other thing, regions do. Okay, so some of these regions are signals, okay, which are recognized by proteins, which are now in the nucleus, that are going to bind to, a to, to or recognize these signals. Okay, so let's say you're looking at um, the heart tissue. 
right? And you might want some specific proteins. Um, the, you might want this gene to be expressed. Already, the heart contains these proteins. These proteins might bind to their to give some signal, um, uh, bind to these signal and transcribe the gene, and the gene might get expressed in the heart. Okay. Now, the same gene might be required in uh, in, in the lung in which case you might have a different control, right? So these are different switches that are being controlled by different proteins. It, um, and, and in the lung, you might have a different um, region that contains these binding sites, okay? So these regions are called enhancers because they enhance transcription, okay? Um, so, so just to put things in, 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 in a more sort of computer science way or a cartoon way, so you have a gene, Right, which may be used only in the heart and the lungs, but it might be controlled by two different genes, the regions. So one region might be uh, controlled, might be bound or recognized by heart proteins and switched on, and the gene might be switched on, and another region might be switching it on, you know, uh, for the lung. And it's, we are trying to understand, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, biologists, uh, many biologists are trying to understand what these regions are, where they are, and what are those signals out there. Um, and the reason we're interested in doing this is because lots of diseases now are being blamed on not faulty genes. So of course, if you have a faulty gene, your photocopy is going to go wrong, right? There must be some error, and, and you might have some problem in your heart because your, um, um, your, your protein is not created correctly because there is some error, right? So the, that might get trans the, the error might um, proceed all the way to the protein level. But you can imagine if there's an error, if there's an error here, right? Maybe there's one nucleotide that should be different, and so the signal doesn't exist, so the protein doesn't bind, and this doesn't get switched on. You might have a perfectly good gene, but it's just not getting turned on, right? Because the enhancer region is faulty, right? And these, and this is what is in, uh, what interests a lot of um, um, heart specialists because a, a lot of congenital diseases, heart diseases are now being sort of blamed on these kind of uh, misregulation of genes uh, as compared to faulty genes, right? Because a faulty gene creates a faulty protein um, which often has a much bigger effect than this kind of an effect, which is a milder effect, but still can lead to issues. So we had a collaborator who was really interested in the heart, okay? and they um, sort of um, asked us whether we could you know, identify uh, heart enhancers for them. And so this is where this is part of my really old postdoctoral postdoctoral work. Um, so like I said, these regions can be anywhere. They are not that long. They have no structure, right? But then what do we have? Um, we do have some regions that have been identified in a painstaking way. Uh, by uh, uh, biologists. We have an idea of regions which are not regulatory regions. So what do we have? We have like a positive set and a negative set. So the question is, can you now distinguish between the two sets, right? So it's just like the bacteria problem, right? You have a, some bacterial DNA and you have some human DNA, right? But instead, this is all human, but now you have a positive and a negative set. So a simple, um, uh, calculation of ACTTs is probably not enough because they're all from the same genome. So the, the proportions of ACTTs are not going to really change. But then if you go back to what to the biology, uh, we do know that there is a set of proteins that is, you know, binding these regions. So there are um, um, regions, the signals that the proteins are binding must be more often in those regions than other regions. Right? So the, those are kind of clues uh, that we can get from this data. Okay, so I'm just going to cut the story short and take, take a shortcut here. So we did a lot of, took a lot of uh, different types of sequence features. We didn't stop at simple ACTD, but we also looked at triplets and, uh, and, and even higher order um, value, uh, uh, higher order um, uh, correlations uh, to sort of distinguish between the two sets. Okay, and so once we did that, we had a the, the, we wrote a program the, the algorithm and the algorithm said, okay, this is my rule. This is the rule that I come up with. So what do you do with the rule? So once you have a rule, you can take your whole human genome and just, you know, pass 
through pass it through the uh, method or the, or the algorithm and ask it to predict. Right? So it made these predictions. Um, so we, we do have uh, computational ways of uh, checking whether these um, predictions are meaningful, right? I mean, I mean, anybody can come up with these peaks, but are they really useful? So, so one way of doing this is um, uh, through experimental testing, okay? So here's a little bit of biology. Okay. Um, um, so, so you can see some really cool things um, biologists have come up with uh, looking at nature. Okay. So what they do is make use of what is called a reporter gene. Okay. So a reporter gene is something like this. So it's a green fluorescent protein, for example, which is present in, uh, in the jellyfish um, in, in the sea. Okay. And um, this is a protein that um, fluoresces. So obviously it tastes of it. Uh, especially when under UV light, okay. So, so, so these, uh, so this, the discovery of this protein also won um, uh, a, low, a Nobel Prize. Okay, so this protein uh, sequence is known. So, what people do is take this protein sequence, um, add to it the predicted uh, enhancer region next to it, and now if your enhancer region is really active in the heart, then this gene. Right, this protein, the, the nice bright yellow pro green protein, should glow in the heart. Okay, so what you do is you create this artificial construct of DNA, and you insert it in the egg. Okay, and you don't do this in humans for obvious reasons, right? Um, so you can do this in the mouse. So this is a fertilized mouse egg that you can see the picture of, and you can see it being injected. This piece of DNA. And you do this for multiple eggs because the, the DNA has to get sort of uh, uh, assimilated in some way uh, in, the, in the genome, right? Because it needs to uh, duplicate and so on, right? And then the idea is that if the region is important, right, um, for the enhancer activity, then it will have those signals, the proteins will bind, and the pro this gene will turn on, and you will see a glowing heart, okay? Um, and they do this um, not just for the heart. So here's an example of three um, baby mice, who, who, uh, one of which has been injected uh, with that kind of a system that glows in the skin, okay? And under UV light, this is what the mouse looks like, okay? Um, so you can tell very, very quickly that which of the cells, uh, which mouse really took, took, took up that uh, GFP protein, okay? Um, so this is uh, when you can see it on the skin, but we, we were interested in the heart, right? So our collaborator, uh, Marcelo, uh, decided to do this first on zebrafish, okay? So these are really tiny fish. They look really nice, colorful. Uh, the reason you do this, they do this in zebrafish is because it's cheaper and their embryos are transparent, okay? So you can see what's, you know, any, if anything is glowing while they're growing. And so they, they took our predictions. So remember that these are uh, heart predictions, okay? So these are regions that we think are important for the development of the human heart, okay? Um, and we are putting this in a zebrafish. Zebrafish also has a heart, but it looks a little different, as you can imagine, from the human. But nevertheless, you can see that this is the, the, the zebrafish embryo. You can, this is where the heart is, I've been told. Um, you can see that it is glowing, right? You do see some other glowing parts, apparently the stomach and the eye also takes up, and it's non-specific, but you can see that um, the heart is glowing, right? And only when Marcelo was convinced that he won't be uh, wasting money, that he did this experiment in uh, mice. And you can see that um, while the, the, embryo, the mice embryos are also um, the heart, this is the dissected heart. Uh, this is not the green. If you're trying to see why this is blue and not, why you're trying to understand why this is blue and not green, because this is uh, a different protein. It's the luciferase, but it's the same concept. It just gives a blue color. Um, and you can see that it, it kind of, it works. He also shared a movie where you can see, right, the uh, heart, the, the this heart lining um, moving as in, in glowing, right? Um, 
so yeah so this was this is very satisfying because this is uh this is a method that is you know uh, just looking at distributions of acg keys in, in a different way and trying to predict which new regions could be critical for the human heart development um and it is also to me uh, it was pretty cool because like i said this is the human uh, part that is working in the zebra fish Okay, so this doesn't mean that it will definitely work in the human because we cannot do these experiments in humans, right? You see that, right? This example is good enough to sort of put that point across. These experiments cannot be done in uh, humans or even primates. It's harder to do it. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to stop here for a little bit. I think I'm already um, closing close to... Um, yeah, if I had a few slides, uh, Zutika, but I can stop here. Uh, if there take questions, if there are, maybe maybe we can take questions, and then if there's some time left, we we'll... sure. Um, excellent. Uh, any questions so far? Please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, now I have a doubt. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Sir, you can't decide. And ma'am, I want to ask that how these regulatory regions are actually found, how they are discovered. The, this region is. How are they discovered? Yeah, we are like how are they found? That this right. area, this position. Yeah, so the original ones, um, are people, so biologists have been working for a long time, right? And many of them, you know, work on a gene by gene basis, right? They will just have one favorite gene that is, you know, is active in the heart, and they will look at all the all these uh, the wide area around that gene. Regions are usually, usually closed, well, largely closed to the gene that they regulate. Um, and then they do this the similar experiment that they did with zebra fish. They will do this as an assay for lots of regions, right? And then see uh, which enhancers were which regions were really active as enhancers. And this is how they built up really, uh, you know, through these painstaking experiments. So now this data set, we didn't have a lot. We had some 70 regions to learn from. Right? So the, we just had these 70 regions or so, some 70 four regions. Um, um, and this was a combination of mouse and human. So we also took mouse regions, and put it all in the same set. So the mouse uh, heart is very similar to ours. Um, zebra fish is a little more odd. But yeah, does that answer your question? The biologist? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, yeah. Ma and uh, ma'am, I have a more doubt. Yes. Uh, like you first talked about spam, spam email. Like how like yeah. probability of words is calculated. Yes. So uh, actually there are many apps like for example True Caller. Like they uh, they depict uh, spam calls also. So how are they depicted? Good question. So I think um, I, so even in your uh, calls sometimes um, it does it come up with suspected spam and it asks you to feed it information. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. So I think that it learns from uh, what people are uh, uh, you know labeling it as, and and it's a feedback system, and then they keep refining their uh, model. But I really don't know how you know I've never worked in that area, so I don't know exactly how they do it. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ma'am. So, ma'am, we got a sneak peek into what's going on in biology and computer science and mathematics, all like combined intersection of all the fields. But my question is, ki, we have heard like there has been news about modular babies as well, as in like you just told us, just genes store so many information, as in one cell is storing three billion units of information. But then I've heard that we are talking about modular babies as, as well, as in the skin color, as in the type of hair you want, or whatever characteristic features you want, you can get in that baby. So how are they doing that? Like we're in the middle of figuring out how to handle this information, this big information. Like how's that happening? I, um, so first of all, there's ethical issues. Okay, yes, so, let's, uh, so let's leave that aside. Okay, but let's look at it in the scientific point of view, right? from the science point of view. So if you, um, um, so I showed you the regulatory region, right? So you, you have a region that is controlling a gene um, in, in some way, but that same region might be doing other things. Okay, so let's say, so, so for example, you do, we do know now 
um, which regions give you a brown eye color or a blue eye color and things like that. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. Right. So, but we also don't know uh, whether they do other things, right? So the holistic uh, view we still don't have. So just changing a few things, you think that it might have a particular effect, which it might, but in addition, it might have others. Okay, so unless we can really um, tease out the whole system, the complete network, um, doing these experiments in humans is not a good idea, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen, what uh, bad effects could happen, right? Um, so they do this in flights, for example. It's very common to do this. Uh, they change the fly eye colors and things like that. Um, but beyond that, um, it's because we still don't understand all the implications of changing one thing, how the whole system changes. Uh, I get it, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. But ethical issues are much more, right? Yeah, even if you do figure out how it changes, uh, it's still not a good idea until the ethics are cleared. Yeah. More questions? Okay. So I just, you know, had a couple of slides which I thought was relevant because it was uh, women in uh, statistics and uh, math. So I could just quickly uh, go through them or, uh, you know, I have like five minutes. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, that would be great. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, so let me just, uh, maybe you guys already know this, know of this um, game. Um, do you know this Monty Hall game show? Has this, if this has been talked about in this uh, in this particular um, program, then I will not talk about it because it's just been a repetition. Tutika, this has not been talked about, right? Uh, no, not not yet. So go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so this there's uh, there's this person called Monty Hall who had this game show where on TV, right? And he would invite these uh, the participant onto the stage and show him or her three doors, okay, one, two, labeled one, two, three. And behind one door was a fancy car, okay? And behind the other two doors was uh, a goat, okay? And the basic premise is you don't want a goat and you want the car, okay? <laughs> and uh, if you open the door with a car, you would get the car, okay? So that was your reward, okay? So the game would go as follows. Um, uh, he would give you the option of choosing any door. Okay, so let's say you chose door one. Okay, um, then he would look at the other two doors and um, pick and and open a door which definitely you know contained a goat. Right? So clearly, one of the doors is definitely going to contain a goat, right? Um, and he would open one of them which contained the goat and showed you the goat and ask the question: Would you like to switch would you now like to switch your original uh, door to number three or do you want to stay with number one okay this was his question um are there any uh, guesses what do people think do you think it matters uh, do you think uh, it's better to switch you can think for a minute um you can uh, type in the chat box if you yeah, like type in the chat box and while you're thinking, uh, let me just go on with the second part of this, this, this story. Okay. Um, so there's this, this, this person called Marilyn Boss Savant. Okay. And her, I think she still is considered the person um, uh, having the highest recorded IQ, okay, some 200 and something. Right? And she was born in 1946. Right? And she used to write a column called Ask Marilyn in a, a magazine called The Parade. Okay? And, you know, so the basically thing was that this is the smartest woman who's going to answer questions for you. You can ask whatever questions you wanted. And one of the questions a, a writer asked was this, the Monty Hall question, and asked her whether it's a good idea to switch or not. Okay? And her answer was the following. She wrote back saying that, yes, you should switch. And the first door, has a one third chance of winning, but the second door now has a two third chance to so switch. This was her, her answer. And this goes, is a little counterintuitive because people used to think, I mean, I don't, I have not seen the chats or what, and it's okay if you didn't chat, type it, um, but 
but a large fraction of people thought that the odds don't really change. It's now 50-50 because you just now know that this one has a goat, so it could be either of the two doors. Um, turns out that that's, that she's, she's right, but a large um, majority of the pop population was reading the, these articles, which included um, PhDs in statistics, um, thought that she was wrong. And they wrote really angry letters to her by saying things like, please help by confessing your error and in future being more careful. This is somebody from um, George Mason University, somebody else saying that there is enough mathematical illiteracy in this country. We don't want the world's highest IQ propagating this more. And may I suggest that you opt in and refer to a standard textbook and before you answer this question, and then you're utterly incorrect. You know, these are all people with uh, math, math backgrounds and math uh, edu uh, higher education. Um, and then she sort of, she had to spend two different um, uh, columns um, after these questions explaining the answer to her. And she also said that since uh, um, she, she, she wrote specifically to school teachers and said that you try this out in your classrooms. Okay, so what she said was you divide your students into pairs, right? And uh, the pairs can play this Monty Hall game, not with a card, of course, but with maybe paper cups and a toffee or candy underneath one of them. And you can do this exercise and you ask in a half of the pairs to switch and you ask half the pairs to stay the same and see what you get. And they wrote back saying, you know, uh, uh, assuring her in the audience that she was correct. Uh, one of the uh, questions, one of the, comments was this, maybe women look at math problems differently than men. This was an angry letter saying that you just don't know nothing and maybe women look at different math differently. Um, so I think, so he meant this in a derogatory way, but um, I think maybe there is some merit, right? To this um, sentence that not just women, but people with uh, different backgrounds, um, different educational backgrounds, different all sorts of uh, experiences looking at problems, um, that have not so far been looked at with a diverse from a biodiverse community. So I'll just end here because I thought this is a story night that would go into your little pro this nice program. And I'll take questions. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Again, please feel free to mute unmute yourself and ask questions. So just a little bit of insight, uh, Leelavati, you, you took my sixth lecture. This was essentially going to, this whole sequence was going to be my sixth lecture. But to the students, what we'll do is eventually the answer, I think, was solved uh, by computers who convinced simulations that convinced the non-believers that uh, Marilyn was actually right. So we'll actually do simulations on this uh, in one of our lectures to convince ourselves as well. Okay. <laughs> So, so um, to, to the rest of you, I mean, if you have questions about the earlier part, do write to me. Um, you can you can find my email address online. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you're not comfortable asking here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, well, in, in that case, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Lilavati, and we'll finish the uh, the the uh, terms of the day today and I guess we'll see you all uh, later yeah and please uh, like Ilavati said please feel free to email her or us or anybody else if you want to know more information about this thanks again bye-bye